Welcome to the Dr. Me First podcast with me, your colleague in medicine and coach in life, Dr. Erin Wiseman. Hey, 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 all my friends. I'm so glad to have you back on another episode of Dr. Me First. I'm excited to drop this series of podcasts. I was kind of on hiatus there for a couple weeks. I don't know if you noticed that I really wasn't putting out too many podcasts, but over the next couple weeks, you guys are going to get hit with a lot of episodes. And I've also changed the format a little bit. You'll get several episodes that have conversations with me talking with other female physicians, but then in each drop, you are going to get a solo cast purely from me. You want to know the reason behind this? Well... I have been dealing with a little bit of imposter syndrome. Dun, dun, dun. You know that stuff that we all have where we think we're not good enough or that it's a mistake or nobody wants to hear our voice or we sound so stupid on a podcast. Yeah, I've been dealing with my own shit. And I finally just bellied up to the table and I was like, you know what? People are emailing me. They're wanting to talk to me. I'm doing more speaking events. Why am I not talking more on my own damn podcast? So that's the reason for the solo cast now. As you can tell, I'm not going to go 100% to solo cast because I really do love the conversations that I'm having with other female physicians. And I'm always looking for more guests. So if you've been thinking about coming on, it's your time. You need to do it. Peer pressure coming at you right now. But for today's solo cast, I'm going to talk about a lot of different things. We're going to do three different segments on three different topics that have been rolling around in my brain for a while. The first topic we're going to talk on is a new Instagram campaign that's hashtag Dr. Not Misses. It was started by one of my really good friends, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But that's going to be the first part. The second segment I'm going to talk about why maternity leave though that it can suck because you're taking care of a newborn and you're in the fourth trimester, but why I think maternity leave is the best time to talk to a life coach, to get your shit in order, and to figure out what you want to do moving forward in your life. So I'm going to talk about that. And then in the last segment, I'm going to talk about why everybody needs a person. I don't know if you're a Grey's Anatomy fan, but I go way back and I think I watched most of the first couple seasons live in my dorm room in college. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Meredith and Christina and how that translates into my own real life and why you need a person and what that entails, what that relationship should look like, and why it's so important. And if you don't have one, how you can get one. So hang around with me for this solo cast and we'll get started in the next segment. All right, are you ready? Segment number one. So talking about the campaign of hashtag Dr. Not Mrs. on Instagram, if you haven't joined it yet, you need to get in there and look at it. Because my very good friend, Dr. Anu Kathirse, is starting to get some recognition on why the label is so important to use of doctor when we're in our professional role and not allowing others to call us Mrs. or nurse. And really, my why I think this is so good is it because it's really addressing so many issues that we deal with as female physicians. Also with Dr. Anu, you need to follow her on Instagram too because she's doing some amazing work with making understandable fertility education and I absolutely love her sperm videos. Everybody needs to get on there and tell her to do more sperm videos because I think it's amazing. She's an awesome REI specialist in Houston and like I mentioned, she's a very close friend that when we got to meet in person, I just love her energy and I love supporting this campaign for her. But anyway, at the heart of this campaign, I really love that we're all talking about this because haven't we all been called miss or missus or nurse or if there is a male in the room, he is always assumed to be the doctor even if he's like the medical student, the resident, the tech or just an observer, even a house cleaner. It always seems like if you have XY chromosome and look male, then it's presumed that you are the quote unquote real doctor. And there really is a difference. I've tried to talk to our male colleagues about this, that this is something that they have no recognition in and battle against unless they have some awareness and see what's going on. 
And, you know, it's not just the patients. It's also the staff that we work with. I mean, being a nurse is not a bad thing, nor is being married and having the title Mrs. a bad thing. But it's just that in the clinical role, we want to be taken seriously. We want to assume to be the doctor when we walk in and when we say, hi, my name is Dr. Wiseman and this is your nurse Angie. She's going to be working with me today. Because here's the thing, the white coat doesn't help. I've definitely learned that, that it doesn't matter if you wear the long white coat, if you get your name, Dr. Wiseman, printed on the pocket, if you try to wear a special name tag that's really bright and says physician. I mean, we all do those things to try to help our patients identify like, hey, we are in charge, but it's not really working. So I'm really glad to be having this conversation. And I just want to to put it out there and to justify all of you who are feeling these same things that this is not a pride thing. This is not an ego thing. This is having the correct label so that we can solidify the relationship that we're making with that patient when we walk into the room. When we start working in a team, then everybody can have those identifying roles. And when we're working together and we're teaming together, when those roles are clearly identified, it makes situations go so much better. You know, really 99% of problems in healthcare are communication based. Either a breakdown in a a communication, things that were not said, things that were said maybe in a way that the, the hearer didn't hear correctly. And by clearly establishing those roles of who is doing what and what roles that they fill, it's so important. I mean, think about running a code. We've all done, Um, ALS, BLS, PALS, ATLS, trauma certification, all of those things. And what's one of the very first things that you do in any of those situations? You clearly identify everybody's roles. So I don't know why this is such a big deal that when female physicians want to be called doctor, that not everybody can get on that, that same board. So, you know, going with this, my quick story with it that really, well, two stories. The first story is the one that is kind of the sucky one, but the second one is the good one. And the first story was when um, I was uh, a new hire in an emergency room. This was not the first time I'd worked in an emergency room. It was, I wasn't a novice. I wasn't a trainee at all. I mean, I was a full attending physician. But during a shift, I kept noticing a couple nurses who were taking care of a mutual patient with me, going over and running our case past my male counterpart who was working the room as well. And I finally asked them, like, what are you doing? If there's some issues, I'd really appreciate it if you came and talked to me about our patient together. And, you know, one of the responses, well, you're new, and we know Dr. Such and Such. He's worked here for a while. And I finally had to say, you know, it's inappropriate. If there's an issue, I'm the attending physician, you need to come talk to me. I don't know what was at the root of the matter with that. And I feel like perhaps it could have been handled differently um, with my male counterpart coming and talking with me or just approaching the nurses and saying, hey, you know, this is something that Dr. Wiseman's handling appropriately. You need to go talk to her. But in that situation, I can see where that grows and festers imposter syndrome because not only do I have to continually justify my identity to patients, but I have to keep reaffirming to my staff who are questioning my identity and my competency and my ability. And so that's kind of the bad example. And I imagine you guys have similar ones as well. My good example, though, was in the same emergency room um, one evening shift a nurse came up to me and said, hey, Aaron, room 12, blah, 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 blah. And the charge nurse said, whoa, stop. This is Dr. Wiseman, and you will address her as such. She has completed X number of years of training, and she has been out of practice five years. You need to address her in the role that she is filling. And I can't tell you how much that meant to me. It was amazing. I even noticed when I was working on a shift with her, not that it was her intention or anything, but I knew I was supported. 
I knew she had my back. And that little flickers of reaffirming my identity and even continually questioning myself, like, can I do this? They weren't there as much because those roles have been clearly identified. Not that people were put in their place, but it was a wrong that needed to be righted. And many times we try to do it ourselves, but where real, real traction happens is when we win over teammates who can do that for us. And so I just want to encourage all of you that if you are facing that gender bias this week, even today, that we got your back out here in this podcasting world. We're supporting you. And the first and best thing that you can do is know that you are meant to be here. You are meant to be in the role that you're in. You've worked super hard for it. You've made it through all of those challenges. You don't need to continually question if you are supposed to be there. You are. You are meant to be in the role that you're completing. So stop with those thoughts in your head. Just keep reminding yourself, I am meant to be here. I am capable. And secondly, I want you to start talking with your team members, be it in an office, in an outpatient setting, in an inpatient setting, in an emergency room, in an OR, whatever that is, and just talk with them that why it's important that they address you as Dr. Wiseman, or as Dr. Smith, or Dr. Ube, whatever it is, once you can give that understanding that they know why it's important to you, and that there is a gender bias attached with not calling female physicians doctor, I think they'll be more respectful. I think you'll win over more teammates. And I think that it will help you with your imposter syndrome, just like it helps with me. Now, I know there's some people who in their team, they just say, oh, we're just familiar with each other and we call each other by our first names. And I guess that's fine for you, but I would ask you to search really deeply. Ask yourself why. Why is that okay? Is it because you are just tired of fighting the fight? Or is it because it truly is an equal playing field that when you walk into the room with your white coat, you no longer face implicit gender bias? that people know that you're the physician. Because I'm going to guess 90% of the time, that's not the case. And so I would encourage you to push back or at least to think through that before you get into that role. All right, segment number two, using maternity leave to find clarity. This is a big shout out to my friend, Dr. Jill Shear. We were having lunch the other day And we both were talking about how through our maternity leaves, it absolutely helped us to clarify what we wanted with life and with our practice. And so many times I actually get contacted by our fellow female colleagues when they go on a maternity leave or maybe they're having a pregnancy complication and they're taking an early leave. But it's almost like a time where you can take a breath of fresh air and get some clarity. So I wanted to talk through it today because maybe you're in that situation or maybe you can think retrospectively when you were on a maternity leave, maybe some things that popped up in your mind and it's time to think about it again. So maternity leave is a great time to bond with your baby, to do tasks that you wouldn't usually be able to do because you're wrapped up in your medical practice, or maybe even take a small trip that you've been looking forward to. Now, don't get me wrong. That postpartum period seriously is the fourth trimester. There is so much going on with your own body, with your emotions, with your sleep cycle, everything with that, in addition to gaining a new little person in your life. That I'm not saying that this needs to happen immediately, or maybe in your own circumstance, it doesn't need to happen. But what I do find when coaching other mom colleagues is that they do contact me a lot of times during maternity leave. You know, during leave, you have somewhat normal people hours that you can actually talk to other people. Uh, But also, it's a time for physician moms where we're totally away from work. People tend to leave us alone when we're on maternity leave. Now, you know, there's some self-imposed things. Yes, I was one of those crazy women who still went into the office and signed paperwork and checked up on patients and that sort of thing. But for the most part, workplaces are really good about letting you totally disconnect from the workplace if you will allow yourself to do it. And so because of that, 
then it gives you space to think about your work or your work environment and if it's the best fit for you or your family. I had one mom explain it to me and she said maternity leave to me was like coming up on the deep end of the swimming pool and getting a breath of fresh air. I was able to go on play dates with other moms. I was able to pick my kids up from school. I was exhausted, but we were able to just do things I'd always wanted to do that I couldn't do because of my job. Now, as I'm getting ready to go back to the office, I'm really fearful of losing these things. I want to know if I can still be a doctor and also have these great experiences. And you know what I told her? I said, absolutely, you can have this. It's going to take some work and some negotiation, but if this is the life that you love and that you want to live and that you've experienced and it's now bringing you joy in your life, then this is what we need to work towards. So mama, if you've had a similar experience, I just want you to know that that change is possible. Your maternity leave can actually show you the life that you could be living, you know, the breakaway from healthcare. And it can even be a time to renew yourself on why you love medicine. Maybe it's self-revealing and shows you why you need to continue in what you're doing. And it also can show you where you need to modify your practice. So consider these. What are you loving about your life during this time? What things are you ecstatic that you don't have to do while you're on leave? For me, that was no call responsibility. I realized during my maternity leave that call was really draining me more than what my newborn did. So that was one insightful thing for me, that I was really ecstatic that I didn't have to do. And so moving forward in my life, that's one thing that I've been really cognizant about because I know how much of a drain it was. And then another question is, what are you dreading when you think about going back? Because that's really important to think about too. I mean, if you're seriously dreading something, maybe it's time that there's a modification there. Maybe there's a way that it can be modified or removed or, you know, totally changed. But you really got to get some clarity to see what that is. Because sometimes with just one change, one modification, it can make your whole work experience just up level. And you can go from, now I'm a doctor, to, yeah, I'm a doctor, and I'm loving practicing medicine again. Or maybe you try to make that modification, and you see that it's not going to change. That can give you clarity on whether or not it's time for you to make some transitions. And so it's really important to think through these questions. So let me say them again. What are you loving about your life during this time? What are the things that you are ecstatic that you don't have to do while you're on leave? And what are you dreading when you're thinking about going back? So if you feel like you're drowning in the deep end, it's time to come up to the light for a breath of fresh air, my friend. And guess what? You can stay on the surface and you can live in this wonderfulness. You can modify your life. And I know that with just a little bit of help and a little bit of talking, you too can bask in the amazingness of what you loved about maternity leave. So I would love to hear from my fellow colleagues who are on maternity leave right now. Tell me how it's going. And remember, help is available. I think that's something we forget when we are not always surrounded by other people. We don't always want to reach out. And remember, isolationism is a bad thing. Reach out for help. Be it your sisters in medicine, your friends outside of medicine, or family. Reach out for help because we're here for you. All righty. Third and final segment. This one I'm entitling, Everybody Needs a Person. Okay, so time warp with me back to 2006. I remember sitting in my college dorm room watching the first season airing live of Grey's Anatomy. And I remember in exquisite detail the moment that Meredith was talking with Christina and the line, I'm your person, has always stuck with me from that moment on. I was watching this with my college roommate, my best friend, still a great friend, Holly. And I remember telling her, hey, you're my person. And there's been times I had to call her in to be my person, to talk to me. And the same goes for her. And there's been a lot of people in my life who I think about that. Gosh, 
I mean, it's so true. We all really need a person. And the other opposite side of this is there's nothing worse than when you lose your person. So my story from this is, okay, we're still flashing back into the past. Now let's move up to 2017. I had some time to make up at the end of my residency because I'd had two babies and you can hear about them in previous ex- um, episodes, but all but one of my classmates had graduated and disseminated into different places into the world and to start their new practices and all that sort of stuff that we do after residency graduation. Well, I was still left finishing up my makeup time from my maternity leaves for my babies and I just felt absolutely gutted. I had the feeling that I was absolutely alone in the world. Though I was still in the same residency building, doing familiar work, seeing the same patients, but there was something that was just heart-wrenching, that I had lost my people. You know, they had moved on to something different, and I was still stuck in the same place. It felt like, also, whenever you transition from second year to third year, in medical school rotations. You go from all book work and taking boards to going to different hospital rotations and even medical school graduation. Even though the people that I had hung out with our first two years, we had gone to different places, there was something about that transition, that graduation from medical school and everybody disseminating more into residency that the people I had gotten so comfortable with, I could tell my deepest, darkest secrets, they were gone. Yeah, they were a phone call away, but it's just different. You know what I mean. Those transitions. Life was never going to be the way that it was. We were never going to be the the way we were together. And it's just so important that at every single stage that you have a person. And I'm advocating this so hard right now for everyone in healthcare because there's been some research that shows that building that community, having a few strong Uh, interpersonal relationships is a negating um, risk factor for burnout. So it actually helps against burnout by having community, by having that. I mean, think about the movie Castaway. He names a freaking volleyball Wilson, and it's his person because you know it was so deeply and rooted in him, Wilson was, because when Wilson gets taken away by the waves and the storm, like he really mourns that. So we all need our person. And I don't want you to get a volleyball. I want you to get a real person. And I want to help frame how this relationship of your person needs to look like to keep it healthy on both sides. So first recommendation is one, this relationship of your person has to be framed in a safe space. And not in the sense that you can't talk about hard things. But what I mean is like a soundproof, military-grade bomb shelter that's safe from the outside. So that within the relationship of you and your person, you can fall apart in a safe manner, show your wounds, and then be put back together better because it was held in a safe space. Because the thing is, when you have a person, you have to get vulnerable. I mean, this is this is beyond just like small talk and coffee chats. You and your person, it's deep stuff. And so reco- recommendation number two is acknowledging that your person will not have your answers. I think that's really, really important. Too many people come in to me as their life coach and just expect me to give them a protocol or a worksheet that's totally going to fix everything in their life. But here's the thing. Having a person is about having a safe space with vulnerability with someone who believes in you and holds that space for you so that you can explore, you can gain awareness, you can have the most biggest creativity, imagination, and they love you for it no matter. But they're not there evidently to give you all the right answers because if you haven't figured out yet, nobody knows the right answers. But they're within you. That's the important thing to remember is that your answers are within you and by using other people, it can help draw those out, pull those out, see them in a new light. So remember, your person will not have your answers, but they will have your back. Third recommendation is that your person has got to be able to see your future potential. They've got to love the hot mess that you are and know that you're going to be an even more beautiful mess in the future. 
because it's really important that they have that mind frame when you're speaking with them because sometimes that's what we lack ourselves and that's when we need to lean on our person so they can remind us how amazing the future is going to be for us as we keep moving forward. And the last recommendation that I have in having this person relationship by holding this space is that this person of yours can call you on your bullshit and support you still. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I got a lot of bullshit. And it seems totally and perfectly justified in my own mind. But if you have the right person, they're going to love you and say, Aaron is total and utter bullshit and you know it. And let's talk about it. Because it's important to have that. It's important to have that person who can throw us back in bounds and help us wrestle with it, help us change our mindset and see like, yeah, we're just telling ourselves some lies or we're just putting ourselves into a box and then crying about it when it's like, no, just get up, get out of that box. So everybody needs a person. Super, super important to have. And honestly, that's why I became a coach because I want to be someone's person. That's the greatest thing about coaching is that as a coach, I get to be the this, this stability for being somebody's person. I'm here and I'm staying here and I'm not going anywhere and I've got some amazing tools and exercises to help my person transcend beyond where they're at. So if you don't have a person, get a person. If you have a person but you need more, get another person and get another person. And because it's so important that we keep creating that community around us. Because remember, you are not alone and help really is available. And your current situation is not a predictor on your future. So thank you so much for hanging with me in this solo cast. I guess you could say my ranting, whatever you want to call it. I'm just excited to start on this new journey, to be talking directly to you. Talk directly to me. Get on Instagram. Let's talk. Send me an email, whatever. I'd love to hear from you. So as I close, and how I always do, your life, your calling, your pulse matters. Bye, guys. Bye.